So I think this next phase, so the next bull market or the next business cycle, will see a mass onboarding of institutions. I've seen this space before. Usually it's the family offices are first to take risk. And we've all seen that in the space. Many family offices were the first to invest because they're freer to do what they want with their own capital. As I said, most of the institutions have done work, including the investment banks. And so now they just need price confirmation and then they'll be in. So I think we'll see a lot of that. Now, that kind of makes sense because you know, the asset class at peak was 3 trillion in 2021. It's almost impossible for retail investors to continue the pace of adoption. It needs the institutional capital as well, which drives out the ongoing adoption curve. So, you know, my view is still at the end of this cycle, the space is probably 10 trillion. According to Raul Pal, the driving force behind the upcoming market cycle will be the whales. Whales refer to institutional and highly sophisticated investors, such as asset managers, hedge funds, and family offices, often comprising extremely high net worth individuals. Unlike retail investors who allocate thousands of dollars, whales invest tens of millions, hundreds of millions, or even billions of dollars. There are already indications that major players like BlackRock, Fidelity, and Valkyrie are vying to be the first to introduce a spot Bitcoin ETF, indicating the growing interest of whales in the cryptocurrency space. Raul Pell predicts that the entire cryptocurrency market cap will reach $10 trillion in the next bull market, a significant increase from the current $1 trillion valuation. He emphasizes the importance of whales in driving crypto adoption, as it's not just billions of dollars that are needed to fuel the industry's rapid growth, it's trillions. Retail investors, like everyday individuals, don't possess the capital required to influence markets to the same extent as whales. In the video, Raul elaborates on the factors that are likely to attract whales to the crypto market. You know, my view is still, at the end of this cycle, the space is probably 10 trillion plus. And that happens because of the institutions coming to the space offer more products to their clients. So institutions coming into the space tends to mean that BlackRock offers a product to their network of advisors. So it allows more money to come into the space via different mechanisms, i.e. aggregated mechanisms of funds as opposed to individual accounts being open on Binance, for example. So just different me methodology, but it's, it's just the growth of the capital into the space. I'm not sure they yet fully understand how driven by the business cycle and liquidity cycle crypto is. But I think they know that you could extrapolate all the complexity away and it's like, if it's risk on for assets, people want to own technology stocks, crypto will go up more. So I think they understand that basic premise. And when the cycle slows down, crypto goes down more. That's the volatility cycle. But over time, the returns compound. I think they understand that. As I said, it, I don't think it concerns them. It's a matter of position sizing for them to make sure it fits within the portfolio. And the structure of markets, I don't think it dramatically changes because the business cycle essentially rules everything. That's the risk in the credit cycle and all of those things. So it's the same thing is when they get ready to allocate to risk. Now, if you look at surveys right now, most institutional investors are still underweight equities, even though they went up a lot. I mean, the Nasdaq almost got to all time highs. Most of them haven't participated. And that's the same with crypto. They've still got this nervousness about recession, inflation. What are we supposed to be doing? I don't want to make a mistake. But sooner or later, they get comfort and you'll see them going up the risk curve with equities. And then eventually they'll follow with the digital asset side of the equation. And that's very typical in most markets. You, know, you see the same in junk bond markets, emerging markets. And I would put crypto, you know, if you want to think of it simply from a traditional asset manager, it's a high tech emerging market. I mean, that's what it is. They're volatile, but they tend to massively outperform and they outperform even more when the central bank is printing money. They need it to happen slowly because there's a lot of work to be done, but it's happening and they know it. For example, a friend of mine used to be at one of the biggest banks in Australia. Uh, he was one of the senior people running treasury and credit and trading and risk. And he's like, I spoke to him after he retired recently and he said, well, we've been spent the last couple of years working on stable coins. I'm like, why does an Australian bank need stable coins? And he's like, oh, we've done them in five currencies. I'm like, is this for retail? You know, why are you trying to do that? He's like, no. He's like, the US equity market is going to go from T plus three to T plus one settlement, which means you settle the following day for the trade that you did. He said, we're in Australia. We have to do foreign exchange transaction and we've got this happens overnight for us. Foreign exchange markets are T plus two or T plus three. He said, we can't settle our trade. So we have to have a stable coin to settle the trades with our US broking entities. So you're realizing that they're going to blockchain to solve just infrastructure issues like that. But these are gigantic. These are hundreds of billions of dollars of transactions a day or a week. They're huge. 
but they're seeing it everywhere. So the investment banks are all testing putting uh, securities on the blockchain, bonds, credit. They're looking at how can we use NFT technology, which is really just a contract for the derivative market. You know, why can't OTC derivatives be on chain? They're looking at all of the exchanges are looking at should we use blockchain rails? So all of them have got teams. That's the London Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. Everybody's got teams. Australia recently closed down their team, but they've been working on it for a number of years. We know that even the Middle East are talking about it. So everyone's thinking about, can we move our exchanges to blockchain rails because it's more efficient, it's faster. They're saying, how do we make our payments amongst ourselves, cross-currency payments? How can we do that using digital rails? How can we offer products to our customers around digital assets? So that's offering hedge funds, liquidity and options or swaps markets and other things. How can we offer our asset management firms structured products, guaranteed funds, those kind of things. They're seeing that too. So they're seeing it at every level within their businesses. They also know that central bank digital currencies are coming and they need to think about integration of that too. So they're seeing it infrastructure layer, product layer and customer layer all at the same time. And, you know, people like Goldman have been doing this, building in this space since 2015. So again, a lot of people don't notice or know this because there's so many people up retail participants, pretty much everybody, including JP Morgan, you know, and I go and speak to like Franklin Templeton, you wouldn't have thought of them as cutting edge, but they, a money market fund on the blockchain. They were the first people in the world to do that, which is a different angle of stable coins. And they've been working, they've got a huge team there working on that. The team at Fidelity, looking at what they can do within their business. I mean, when they started it, they started doing Bitcoin payments for coffee in their cafeteria to understand how it worked. All of these people run their own mining nodes. They run the validators. I mean, they do everything. And and I'm seeing that globally. We're seeing in the UK, the banks are, are behind, but the government is obviously moving quite fast forwards and the fintech sectors everywhere as well. They're kind of all working together. So yeah, there's huge momentum. So again, if we step back, most of us just see the Twitter retail markets, but we've got this hedge fund market that's building, getting more mature. We're seeing the investment banks building out everything that needs to be done in the financial system. And we've got the asset management firms getting ready to offer the right products to customers and everybody else doing the work to invest. So what I look at, it's like, makes me kind of proud, right? To see how far we've come because it always feels pretty difficult once you've gone through yet another bear market. And I've, I've seen a few of these, right? But when you actually step back, you're like, this place is growing up fast. So I actually, in 2020, I think it was, I asked one of our Real Vision members who was an expert in building asset allocation risk models with systems like Barra. There's a whole bunch of these. And I said, listen, can you look at Bitcoin properly for us? And how does it work on the kind of efficient capital frontier? How does it fit into the model? What does it do? Now, I don't have that paper at hand, but essentially it depends where you put it in the portfolio. Most people don't have digital asset as a risk bucket. So they either decide, did they put it as FX? Do they put it as VC? Do they put it as what, you know? So that's one of the, actually the harder thing is how do they fit into their in external, uh, internal risk system? But what we found that even though it is the most volatile asset in their portfolio, actually in a portfolio itself dampened the volatility significantly while offering huge excess returns. And we found that somewhere between five and 10%, 10% you get a lot more risk, 5% you're really at the efficient market and it's and it's really adding a lot because don't forget 5% is not a much of an allocation to the S&P, but if crypto markets repeat the kind of performance, you know, they can go up 5X, even Bitcoin. And so that's a lot of performance for the underlying you know, pensioner who's got the policy or whatever. So it fits in very well. And I understood this because I've seen this all before. And that was the, I was at Goldman when the commodities group built the GSCI, which was a commodities index. No institutional asset managers had commodities in their portfolio, didn't fit in their risk models. What bucket do we put it in? Do we put it in as a currency? It was the same argument. And the team went around and educated everybody on the benefits of portfolio diversification by adding commodities in. And that product went from zero to hundreds of billions of dollars as the institutions understood how it worked. That's one of the things that I've been very keen on is whether we like it or not, a lot of the traditional asset management firms don't really understand or speak the same language as those of us who are more native to the digital space. But if the Goldman Sachs asset allocation team sits down with them and shows it to them and puts it into their models and say, we can custody this or prime broke it, they'll do it. If we go back to the conversation we had about these investment banks building teams, that's what these teams are going to do is they will provide the comfort because these guys want to go to their, they want to show that they've taken their fiduciary duty seriously 
and go to their investment committees and say, well, Goldman's built the asset allocation model or JP Morgan have helped us or Morgan Stanley have helped us. This is what we believe it to be. And that's where they get the, the final layer of comfort. So the models do show very much that is very accretive to portfolios. And even in small sizing, it can make a huge difference. But the issue is, as I said, they don't know where it fits in yet. So that's the trickier part. Royal Powell's perspective on the next bull market cycle being primarily driven by whales holds immense significance for the crypto market's future. This insight sheds light on the pivotal role institutional investors play and the potential they possess to reshape the financial landscape. While the contributions of retail investors are undoubtedly valuable, the real game changers are the whales. Their capacity to propel the crypto market cap is unrivaled, and insights from experts like Raul provide us with a clearer understanding of their pivotal role. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.